It is my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend of 25 years, Judge Michael Brennan. Um, Judge Brennan was appointed uh, May, 8, May 2018. His uh, educational background, he was cum laude from Notre Dame as an undergrad. He got his Juris Doctor at Northwestern School of Law, where he was an editor of the Law Review, and he won their moot court competition. His uh, clerkships included Robert Warren, the Eastern District of Wisconsin, and then Daniel Mannion from the Seventh Circuit, a judge we all know and admire. His private firm practice, he was an alumnus of Foley and Lardner, and most recently before taking the bench, Gass, Weber, and Mullins. But uh, before that, in the course of his career, he was also an assistant, assistant district attorney in Milwaukee County. He was staff counsel to uh, Tommy Thompson's uh, criminal commission where he helped, he was staff counsel to the rewrite of the criminal code in Wisconsin. And he was a state court judge for a period of time. He is the founder of the, a co-founder of the Milwaukee chapter of the Federal Society. And more than that, he is literally married to the Federal Society. He met his lovely wife, Emily, in the Old Town and Country Bar in our famous Mayflower Hotel. So without further comment, <laughs> Judge Brennan. Thank you, Chris. And it's an honor to be introduced by you. Be careful if your introducers know that much about you. <laughs> We're going to break with tradition a bit and stay seated for our panel. Our panel's focus is the anti-federalists in the courts, anti-federalists in litigation today. Uh, the question that you'll hear our panelists speak to today are should courts confronting questions of originalism, uh, should they read the anti-federalist papers to understand the Constitution, and what impact might that have on both judicial decision making and briefing? Um, this obviously can arise in a variety of cases. Um, you're here for Oldham Fest. <laughs> and Old, uh, Judge Oldham has uh, worked the Anti-Federalist papers into two of his uh, recent opinions. One from May, uh, the, or excuse me, one from June, the Langley case, which hand, uh, handled the issue of federal habeas relationship between state and federal courts and then also the Tarrant County case, which is longer and a little bit more well known. That was in November, the issue of state sovereign immunity, uh, whether a local workforce development board was the state of Texas. Uh, the case that's mentioned in your materials is called Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt. And Erin Murphy's gonna have more to say about that uh, during her presentation. That overruled Nevada versus Hall, a 40 year precedent. Um, there's other cases, of course, where anti-federalist ideas and papers uh, have uh, trickled up. Uh, one of them was the Heller case from 2008. Justice Scalia, uh, in his consideration of the relationship between the prefatory and the operative clause in the Second Amendment, um, he notes how during the 1788 ratification debates, the fear that the federal government would disarm the people to preserve order um, uh, through, a, through a standing army uh, was pervasive. And in doing so, Justice Scalia talked about the federal farmer. You can go back further to 1995, the decision United States versus Lopez, uh, Justice Thomas concurring, uh, he noted and described the Federalist, Anti-Federalist discussions regarding the Commerce Clause. Hamilton's view in Federalist number seven, Madison's view in Federalist 40 versus the federal farmer in uh, number five. So we are going to um, consider this idea of the anti-federalist ideas today, both in cases and in the court uh, constitutional governance in general. Do anti-federalist ideas matter? And if they do, how do they do so? And in what types of cases? Uh, we're gonna hear from Ilya Shapiro, the director of the Robert Levy Center uh, for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, also the publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. We'll also hear from Scott Keller, who chairs the Supreme Court and Constitutional Law Practice Group at Baker Botts. And we'll also hear from Aaron Murphy, who practices Supreme Court appellate and constitutional litigation at Kirkland & Ellis. Uh, those are their bios. Rather than interrupt the uh, scintillating discussion, uh, that's the background. And we're going to first hear from Ilya Shapiro. Well, thanks for that, Judge. Uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, I've long wanted to come to the Western States Conference, and I guess it uh, 
it took FedSoc paying for my travel to, to make it happen. <laughs> of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and so the, the price was having to study up on the Anti-Federalist Papers at uh, prepare for Oldham Fest. Uh, I think we should keep calling it that for poster posterity. Uh, and I must say about uh, Judge Oldham's uh, presentation, like normally I, I like to say that PowerPoint is unconstitutional. Uh, well, I, I might have to amend that line because I, th I thought that was a very good presentation, and so maybe I'll just say PowerPoint is unconstitutional, at least as applied in 90 plus percent of the cases. And that one, I think, survives strict scrutiny. But that, that was good. Um, it's, it's great, I'll, I'll echo things that others have said, that the Federalist Society has a conference on the anti-federalists. If anyone doubts that we're a debating society that airs out conflicting ideas about the law and a search for the truth, rather than a political advocacy group like the ABA, well, then... Uh, <laughs> then this conference should put that to rest. Uh, I'm especially grateful for being on the third panel of the day, seeing how as uh, on the first one you had to know about history, on the second one you had to know some theory, and this one you just have to read judicial opinions and control F search for anti-federalist. Uh, <laughs> Much like my panel at the National Lawyers Convention, some of you were um, uh, at that, which was on horizontal federalism. A judge uh, moderated that, but that was a misnomer. Horizontal federalism, what is that? Uh, calling those who oppose the creation of a stronger national government anti-federalists is also a misnomer, at least to modern ears. It's more accurate to call them anti-nationalists. Um, but anyway, our charge is to tease out the modern relevance of the anti-federalist, or, or to put a finer point on it. Uh, everything that we've heard uh, up till now, uh, why do we care, other than as a purely academic or intellectual matter? Um, uh, especially to practicing lawyers, which I imagine most of you in the audience are. And I guess they needed someone uh, from Cato, uh, at least two people, because Roger's here as well, uh, to provide that. Um, although, uh, like Roger, I am not going to uh, kill myself out of despair at, at what's become of our constitutional order. Um, luckily, in terms of uh, the, the relevance of all of this theory and history to the present day, our moderator has done uh, us panelists a great service uh, by sending us four, I guess, whether he did his research or his clerks, uh, four Supreme Court opinions that he referenced and two of uh, Judge Oldham's Fifth Circuit opinions that referenced the Anti-Federalists. And since I get to go first, I get to tell you about more about those. Scott and Aaron, you're on your own uh, covering <laughs> other things. Uh, but first, uh, some background, because I, I did feel like I needed to do have some value add be beyond uh, 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 Judge Oldham's uh, article that, that, that we all uh, got uh, circulated. And so I thought since uh, her Herbert Storing's uh, book is out of print. I had to get go to the next best source, uh, Wikipedia, for my uh, in-depth research. Uh, and Wikipedia tells us that the uh, Anti-Federalist main points were, well, actually pretty much what uh, Judd Campbell told us this morning. So first, uh, the Constitution needed a Bill of Rights. Well, the Anti-Federalists uh, uh, won uh, on, on that, although, as Justice Scalia was fond of saying, every tin-pot dictatorship has a Bill of Rights. It's the structure that was the Founders' great innovation. Uh, although, at the same time, without our Bill of Rights and the Court's neglect of the structure over the decades would really have put us uh, in a pickle. Uh, the Constitution created a presidency that was so powerful it could become a monarchy, they warned. Uh, Patrick Henry said at the Virginia Ratification Convention, your president may easily become a king. Well, both in terms of the imperial presidency itself, let alone the administrative bureaucracy, I think the Anti-Federalists were prophetic in that as well. Uh, they argued that the Constitution did too little with the courts, creating an out-of-control judiciary. Now, the jury's still out on that one to an extent. I mean, there, we have this debate about activism, restraint, engagement, the role of the courts. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, the courts uh, have not done an adequate job uh, uh, in, in keeping the, the federal uh, government limited to uh, its constitutional uh, constraints. Um, next, the national government will be too far away from the people and unresponsive. Well, technology has solved that distance, uh, but the national government still can't fix local problems, even though it's now trying to do so. Uh, and finally, the Constitution would abrogate the power of the states, and I think that's 
absolutely right as well. And so, you know, next time, Judge Oldham, you're sparring with Judge Costa about who won and who lost, you can just say, well, actually, the NFLists, you know, they, they lost in terms of the Constitution was ratified, uh, but they won uh, uh, in terms of their complaints about, you know, maybe it's despite the Constitution's structural limits, but in the end, uh, we see a lot of those uh, problems. Uh, of course, the Anti-Federalists, as, as I've been alluding to, as Wikipedia was alluding to, um, thought that the uh, Constitution's checks on federal power would be undermined by expansive interpretations of, for example, the general welfare, uh, which was meant to be a limit, not a grant of power, the necessary and proper clause, which was, was to be uh, used to uh, flesh out enumerated powers, uh, rather than extending to create new powers and creating a federal government with unwarranted and undelegated powers that were bound to be uh, abused. Now, one could quibble with the mechanisms that the Anti-Federalists pointed to uh, that would lead to constitutional tyranny. They didn't foresee that the Commerce Clause would become a, uh, an everything clause uh, justifying almost any conceivable federal intervention um, because the distortion was, was so great that even they couldn't imagine that the government could get away with it. But again, it's uh, difficult to argue with their conclusions in light of the current reach of our government. Um, so anyway, um, you know, we cite the Federalist Papers constantly, but the Anti-Federalists are honored more in the breach. So perhaps we should uh, uh, cite them more because they really forced the Federalists uh, to mollify their concerns. as. Uh, Judge Oldham uh, said it was a discussion, and a lot of what Hamilton, Madison, and Jay were writing about wasn't just in a vacuum, but in responding to these concerns because they wanted to convince their constituents, after all, to ratify the Constitution. The cases that Judge Brennan highlighted, uh, I'll run through them quickly. The Hyatt case, states retain sovereign immunity from private suits brought in the courts of other states. Well, again, the Anti-Federalists were worried uh, that this was extending federal judicial power over controversies between a state and citizens of another state. And so the Federalists, uh, and, and notably Hamilton, gave assurances that no, 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 the Constitution did not allow that. And so the majority in Hyatt cited that. In Heller, nice disquisition between uh, uh, Justice Stevens in dissent, Justice Scalia in the majority, uh, about what the militia meant, about uh, whether the protections were individual or allowed regulations of the militia, meaning uh, the, 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 the body as a whole, very relevant there. The Prince case, no commandeering of state officials. Um, there was a worry that the Anti-Federalists had uh, that state uh, officials would be uh, collectors, uh, ta tax collectors for the new federal government. And again, the Federalists uh, replied, no, that would not be uh, the case at all. U.S. term limits versus Thornton. States can't limit congressional terms. Uh, well, uh, it turns out Alexander Hamilton wrote, uh, again, uh, uh, in response to some concerns that states could not limit uh, the qualifications on federal electors. Uh, and uh, the two Fifth Circuit cases, the sovereign immunity discussion in Tarrant County is fascinating. I'll commend that to you. Uh, and I thought that little interchange uh, between uh, judges Oldham and Costa in the Langley case uh, was, uh, was cute. Uh, Judge Oldham says, the dissenter suggests we should not care about the Anti-Federalists because they lost, but Judge Costa's winners cared about the Anti-Federalists so much that they wrote an entire book to respond to the Anti-Federalists' views. Um, you know, today we would conclude that Brutus was, was too optimistic. Uh, the the federal government has grown exponentially larger, larger than he could ever have imagined, in part because he was writing before the 16th Amendment opened the way for a federal income tax in 1913. The 17th Amendment, I actually don't think, uh, I'm, you know, I don't like it, but I don't think it had that much practical effect because by that point, most states were already, the legislatures were basically ratifying the non-binding popular plebiscites uh, of who should be a senator, although maybe that intermediate check just to avoid a, a mobocracy or what have you uh, would still be, be useful. But the 16th Amendment is, I think, far more consequential in uh, 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 having a, an excessive federal government. Uh, and uh, by interpreting the Constitution, at least on the side of the courts, according to its alleged spirit, rather than being restricted to just the letter of its written words, as the doctrine of enumerated rights would require. 
Uh, and so the Supreme Court, at least until the advent or the rediscovery of originalism, allowed Brutus's nightmare to come to life. And so in short, I think the Anti-Federalists were right in all sorts of ways, uh, not least uh, in uh, understanding and explaining the Constitution. Again, they shouldn't be cited as uh, you know, they were correct normatively in terms of why the Constitution was bad, but in terms of their understanding, the exegesis of the constitutional provisions, no less than uh, what the Federalists were writing about. And so we moderns need to understand their arguments and take them seriously now, uh, and to uh, present the debate more often in litigation, especially whenever we cite the Federalist Papers. Uh, if there's to be any hope uh, of restraining the federal government to the limited powers that was actually granted, given its current tendency to accelerate its growth beyond constitutional limits. Thanks. Thank you, Ilya. Scott Keller. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. It's always heartwarming to come to this conference because here, I look across the room, we have several hundred people here on a Saturday afternoon, a nice sunny Saturday California afternoon, and we're talking about the Anti-Federalists. <laughs> it just warms your heart. I know it warms this guy's heart. Uh, but no, it's great to be with you. Uh, you know, when this panel was being proposed, uh, you know, the Anti-Federalists in the courts, I had an initial reaction, I think Aaron probably shares it, of like, well, courts haven't really done much with the Anti-Federalists. So what are we supposed to talk about? Well, it turns out we do have a few things to say. And, and to piggyback off of what Ilya uh, was talking about, I'm gonna end in a very similar place that he did, but I think it just, it helps to step back a little bit uh, and just remember how we get to the point where we're even talking about why should courts look to the Anti-Federalists? This of course is, you're doing constitutional interpretation. You start with the text, you're looking for the original public meaning. In the course of looking for that original public meaning, we all know we can turn to the Federalist Papers. But then the question is, well, when do you turn to the Anti-Federalists? Uh, you know, in statutory interpretation, we're all very reticent to look at legislative history. And I think it's important, the distinction between trying to figure out when is a source helping understand what the words meant at the time that they were ratified, as opposed to what was some prediction about how this clause or provision should in fact operate. Say so the former is gonna be on firmer ground than the latter. Uh, but you know, I think we also have to keep in mind that we should be careful anytime we're looking at the opponents of a legal text that was ratified by the proponents. And so when we do approach this uh, enterprise of when do we look at the Anti-Federalists, I think we have to keep that background principle in mind. Um, but notwithstanding that, the cases that uh, the judge and Ilya have cited where the Supreme Court has used the Anti-Federalists, um, at least in modern times, I think fall into three different argument types, and I'll just briefly go through those. So the first time, the, the first bucket that I, uh, the Supreme Court has really used Anti-Federalists uh, citations and authorities is to give context to what the Federalists were saying. In other words, the court actually wants to rely on what the Federalists were saying, but to be very clear about what the Federalists were trying to get to, they cite the Anti-Federalists. And so it's not clear that the Anti-Federalists' thoughts are actually doing much of the substantive work there. It's more of just framing the debate. And I'd point to U.S. term limits and franchise tax board as examples of those. So the second category of cases that the Supreme Court has used anti-federalist statements are arguments that essentially everyone at the founding would have agreed on a certain principle. In other words, the federalist and the anti-federalist actually all agreed on this principle. And usually this comes up in the context of either a dissent or a particular position wants to assert a statement and then the court or an opinion says, well, that can't be right because we know both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists thought it was this way. Usually that's gonna come up when you have uh, an originalist mode of interpretation competing against a non-originalist mode of interpretation. I think Heller, I think the dissent in Prince and Franchise Tax Board all fit within that as well. And then the third category that the Supreme Court has really looked at Anti-Federalist statements uh, are, are more just to rebut an argument that the dissent makes. I think Heller itself is probably a good example of this, where Justice Stevens' dissent goes into the anti-federalist statements and then Justice Scalia's majority opinion says, uh, 
Well, wait, why are we even talking about the Anti-Federalists? I think he said that it was, quote, highly problematic, unquote, to be looking at what did the Anti-Federalists think was the scope of the Second Amendment. Of course, then to rebut the dissent's arguments, the Heller majority does in fact go on to rely on the Anti-Federalists. Um, so those have been the three primary categories that the Supreme Court has used Anti-Federalist statements. And I think what you're seeing from the Fifth Circuit in particular is a fourth way or, or, or another way that is different from what the Supreme Court up to this point has really done. And that's recognizing, as Ilya said, that some of the Anti-Federalists' criticisms of the Constitution have come to pass. They have occurred. They were right. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, and so then the question is, what do you do about that? Do you do anything? I think where this all leads is it really falls back onto the Federalists. And you have to ask yourself, well, what if the Federalists were wrong about the text or the operation of a particular constitutional provision? I mean, the 11th Amendment uh, and, and that whole history, of course, is probably a very direct example of that, where you had the Anti-Federalists saying, oh no, a when a state gets sued by a citizen of another state, that doesn't waive immunity. I mean, that was Madison and Marshall and Hamilton. They all, no, of course that doesn't. Well, what did the Supreme Court say? Yep, it does. Then the people reacted, the 11th Amendment was passed. So that would be an example where the Federalists were just wrong as to how in practice the Supreme Court would interpret those provisions. And so I think you could ask, were the Federalists wrong about any of the other provisions? I think Ilya highlighted uh, possibly a, a couple areas in particular, uh, enumerated powers, non-delegation, we could probably talk about some others, where maybe the anti-federalist critique of how the text would be interpreted and how the Constitution would operate, maybe those came to pass. And if that's the case, well, then how should, those how should those provisions be interpreted going forward? And, and, and how much should the Federalists be, how much should courts rely on the Federalists when the Anti-Federalist critiques seem to ring true? And, and where I think this, the rubber may meet the road with constitutional or legal doctrine is in the creation of, call it second order doctrines that some in the academy have referred to as making up for the under-enforcement of constitutional norms. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is something along, take the major question doctrine in administrative law. The uh, Supreme Court has said that if Congress wants to delegate authority to an administrative agency to make a, decide a major question, a question with sweeping economic and political significance, then Congress has to clearly state that in the statute that the agency does in fact have that power. Okay, now that's not a prohibition saying Congress can't delegate a major question to an agency. It's just saying, if Congress is gonna do that, it needs to be clear. I think Cass Sunstein would even say that that is the, the type of a non-delegation canon, that we're, we want to enforce that Congress itself really should be making these decisions, but the courts don't wanna bar that, and so they come up with a second order doctrine. Well, I guess what I put forward is, in areas where the Federalists turned out to be wrong and the Anti-Federalists turned out to be right, maybe these would be ripe areas to use that debate to say maybe what's going on is constitutional norms are being under-enforced. If the Federalists said the Constitution was gonna operate this way and the Anti-Federalists said, no, you're just wrong, it's not gonna play out that way, and it turned out that it didn't, and it played out this other way, well, I think we can come back to that category of cases I talked about where the Supreme Court said we could look at what did the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists agree with. Now, they disagreed, but the Federalists were wrong. And so I think the norms, the constitutional values that would be being espoused by both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists in that situation, I think have to ring true when you're doing an originalist interpretation of the Constitution. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that some of what the Federalists say they got wrong. Um, and, and so I guess what I'd leave you with is if courts are going to start to look at the Anti-Federalists more, I think that that area where, and this is what the, the Fifth Circuit and Judge Oldham have picked up on recently, is what if we're looking at where the Anti-Federalists were right? And then the question is, what can we do about that? And I would suggest one thing that could be done about that is increasing 
these uh, call it second order doctrines requiring clear statements from Congress when otherwise, con when other constitutional values uh, would possibly be on the line. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to uh, Aaron's presentation. I hear we're gonna get a nice history lesson on the Franchise Tax Board case, so grab some popcorn. <laughs> thank you. Hey, you, you know, Scott, um, I didn't want to interrupt Aaron, but this follows right along something you said. The second order norm thing, that reminded me of uh, Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch's hydraulic pressure point, and I think it was his, his Gundy dissent, might have been Kaiser, but uh, where he talked about, yeah, we don't enforce these things, so we call it something else. The major yeah. question as a remedy for under-enforcing non-delegation is, I think, one of them, yeah. yeah. Aaron Murphy. Well, I don't really know what possessed me to agree to go third on a panel about this topic when everybody seemed to agree at the outset that the court almost never relies on the anti-federalists, so we have a very small universe to talk about. But, uh, but, but fortunately, I still do have a few things left, left to add to the conversation. Um, so if you start with the question that Judge Brennan asked of you know, should the courts be looking at the anti-federalists, uh, what they had to say, it, it seems to me that the answer to that is just like unequivocally and obviously yes. Um, and, and if I just think about it from the role of an advocate, I mean, I know we're not supposed to admit things like that we rely on legislative history, but the truth is as advocates, we put it in our briefs and even Justice Scalia said we should uh, because you should use whatever is at your disposal as an advocate. And I mean, if I had before me legislative history where you know the, the, the sponsor and the supporter said, here's what this means, and the people who voted against it said, you know, I don't want to vote for this because it means X. I mean, of course I would also point to that. Or if you had a debate where the people who didn't support it said, I'm worried this means X, and the sponsor said, no, 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 you don't need to worry, it actually means Y. I mean, of course you'd rely on both pieces of that. that that's just natural and what you, the kind of tools that we use in all sorts of other contexts when we are sort of telling these stories and dealing with interpretation uh, when, it, when we're looking at things beyond just the text itself and understanding some of the context surrounding it. So it, it seems to me, you know, I, I then was going to pose to myself the question of uh, maybe the, the bigger question is like, why don't we rely on them? And why don't, why aren't there decisions that rely on this? And I think some of that is just a, a, a product of familiarity. I mean, you've got, as has been discussed, that the Federalist Papers are widely known and widely circulated and widely read today, and people just aren't as familiar with the anti-federalists and, and their work. So I, that's certainly a piece of it. But I'm also not, you know, I wanted to stop and think about, is it true that they really don't play an important role in what's going on at the court in constitutional interpretation? And I'm not sure that it is actually quite as small a role as we might think about if we kind of confine the question to how often does the court cite the anti-federalist papers? I mean, it's not very frequently. We, none of us could find very many cases where that has happened. But if you ask a broader question of have the anti-federalists had important impacts on aspects of decisions or kind of constitutional interpretation over the years, I'm not sure the answer is as clear. And I you know, stepped back and thought just about some of my own cases. Over the past year, there are three big constitutional law cases that I was involved in at the Supreme Court. And in some way, shape, or form, the anti-federalists had a little bit of a role in all of them. Um, uh, have, have had, they haven't all been decided yet, but they've had a role somewhere along the way. Um, one is the Second Amendment case that hasn't come out yet, and as you've already heard, you know, there was some debate, and there was some discussion in Heller about the role of the anti-federalists when it came to interpreting the Second Amendment. Um, another one of those cases, and you know, apologies uh, ahead for having to say this, and you can all blame Justice Kagan, but as, as some of you know, I've been uh, spending a lot of time learning about the removal powers and uh, defending the constitutionality of the CFPB um, lately. Uh, but if you, you know, this is another context where if you go back and look at a decision like Myers versus United States, it's, it's not a decision that's speaking overtly in terms of an anti-federalist versus federalist debate, but it's an opinion that exhaustively talks about debates that were occurring in the first Congress. Uh, and as many have pointed out, uh, historians have pointed out, I mean, uh, many of the debates about the Constitution were continued in the first Congress where you had both, both Federalists and Anti-Federalists and they were continuing to work out these principles and, and can figure out things that weren't quite 
you know, that everyone didn't agree exactly on how the Constitution resolved them. And I think there's, there's other contexts beyond that where the first Congress has played an important role in how the court thinks about issues, particularly when they're dealing with constitutional questions and looking at history and saying, you know, what did, how, how was practice, what was the initial original practice uh, back in the day? And it's another context where I think, you know, while you're not looking at the anti-federalist papers as such, they have had an influence on how the court has understood that history and some of the historical debate that surrounds it and surrounds various uh, constitutional questions and provisions. Um, and the third case that uh, that came to mind was Rucho versus Common Cause, uh, the partisan gerrymandering case, where there was actually uh, a couple of roles the anti-federalists had to, to play. The, the principal one is actually not the one I had in mind, which is that we owe to the anti-federalists the term gerrymandering, um, which, which comes from Elbridge Gerry. But there, there actually happened to have been like a couple of rampant gerrymanderers back in the anti-federalists, not just Elbridge Gerry, but uh, one of the other Kind of famous stories of early gerrymandering was Patrick Henry trying to gerrymander James Madison out of the first Congress and, and really largely doing so in an effort to kind of uh, kill off the, the Constitution. Um, but the, the story of this actually ended up playing a role in the court's opinion, uh, because the court pointed to this in, it, in the context of talking about how this was a common practice at and even before the founding, and how that had to inform the question of you know, whether people at the time, whether the framers would have understood the Constitution to provide a remedy for that. So once again, you see these, these, these more subtle ways in which the anti-federalists are having an impact, uh, even if it's not quite so obvious as let's sit down and read the papers next to each other. Um, but that said, I mean, I think it is, it is still true that it is, they, they seem to have an undersized role in my mind uh, in the court's opinions, given that it would seem to be a very, you know, a, a, a very fertile ground for finding history that would be critical context to understanding some aspects of the Constitution. Um, and so, you know, then I started thinking about it from another direction of, okay, well, what has led the court to rely on the anti-federalists uh, when they have? And for most of the cases, you know, I, I'm not totally sure. But it turns out I actually can tell you exactly what led the court to rely on the anti-federalists in the Hyatt versus uh, Franchise Tax Board case. And this is the case that's been referenced about state sovereign immunity. So that's a case that has been to the Supreme Court three times over the course of something like 25 years. Uh, it, it went up there in, in various iterations along the way. Um, and one of the times it went to the court was a few years ago when none other than my law firm, um, not me, but folks at my law firm were representing the Franchise Tax Board in the case. Uh, and we, the year that we had the case up at the court was the year that Justice Scalia passed away. And so the court ended up divided, equally divided on the constitutional question and didn't answer it. Um, but so I, I started wondering, you know, wh wh when did they, when did the anti-federalists get introduced into this debate? And I looked back through the briefs, and lo and behold, they actually got introduced into this through the brief that uh, that my colleagues wrote at our firm. So I went and I asked them, you know, how did this end up being something that we relied on? You know, did did we just like randomly have knowledge of this? Does everybody kind of know about this? Is this just a unique area where the anti-federalists are are more prominent? And uh, it turned out the answer, and I can take like zero credit for any of this because I had nothing to do with this case. Uh, my my partner George Hicks said, you know, I I took all of the law students that were working for us that summer and said, go learn as much history as you can <laughs> about was, was, anything. Was one of them Andy Oldham? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, he just said, I, I, we want to know we, any 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 source that's out there, go find it. Um, and they did, and just spent the time and discovered, you know, some really, and, and there was some scholarship on this. It's not like, you know, we went and found original sources or did anything, you know, that, that heroic, but, um, but basically it was just a product of some good lawyers saying like, 
well, this seems like it would be a useful interpretive tool, so let's look at it, and let's see if we can figure out a way to use it in our briefing and our argument, and they did, and, uh, and it was you know, featured prominently in the briefs that, that were written at that stage of the case, um, and it featured prominently again when we, we had to recuse and couldn't be involved in the third iteration, but it remained in the briefs the next time it made it to the court, and the court, lo and behold, relied on it. Um, so I, I, I take that and, and think about it as somebody who, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm principally an advocate, and I think it's a lesson to those of us here who, who practice in the courts. You know, I mean, Judge, Judge Oldham has this great line about how you can't kind of only read one side's brief, and I think on, on our side of all of this, I mean, if we don't give them a brief that talks about the importance of the anti-federalists, you can't really blame the courts for not invoking them and seeing their importance to interpretive questions. So I think some of the onus is on us to, you know, see if we can like get these papers back into circulation and uh, and take the time to really study and learn and figure out where are the contexts that it would be useful and present that to the courts and give them the opportunity to think about it because I, it really seems that this is just sort of something that is an anomalous product of nobody really having focused on it, not that there's a good reason for people to not rely on the anti-federalists or a good reason for the courts to not rely on the anti-federalists in the types of cases where they had you know, meaningful things to say that inform the provisions of the Constitution. Thank you. Um, Aaron has talked about history as critical context. Aaron has talked about history as critical context and, and how that formed a background. I think it's fair to say, Scott, uh, probably Hyatt fits in both the second and the fourth categories, as you've noticed, because uh, the second category is a result of arguments everyone agreed upon, the fourth category as a result of criticisms that the Anti-Federalists had. Uh, I want to put our panel on um, uh, uh, the hot seat, and although any, all three of these uh, uh, attorneys file briefs in the Supreme Court routinely every year, and they could get, end up getting involved in these cases, uh, but Ilya, I'll start with you. Obviously, we have the faithless elector cases in which there has been cert granted, one from uh, Colorado, one from Washington. Uh, in addition to the Commerce Clause and the taxing power, one of the things that the Anti-Federalists felt strongly about was the Electoral College and the disconnect that would happen there. Is that the type of argument that you could foresee um, being in included in a brief uh, or not, and why, why or why not? I find this case fascinating. I'm not sure Cato has an interest in it. Uh, Cato Institute, not Cato the Anti-Federalists. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I don't know whether I'm going to file a brief, uh, but my my instinct, uh, and some of the his legal historians could probably answer this uh, uh, more accurately uh, or with more confidence th than I can, but my instinct is that um, they didn't like the Electoral College or they didn't like mechanisms in the Constitution that took power away from the states. And so the issue here is whether the state can regulate who becomes an elector and who is counted uh, for purposes of the presidential ballot. And so I think they would be ultimately okay with Colorado or Washington uh, saying we, we can't have faithless electors and either um, not certifying them or, or, or punishing them if they vote in a way that they didn't pledge. Scott? Well, yeah, so, you know, in some ways, it's this type of case that probably lends itself the most to what the anti-federalists would say because we just haven't really had many electoral college cases at the Supreme Court. And so I think that the more that you have new ground being tread, instead of having to, you know, build on the precedents and then see what has the court relied on before, the, the easier it's going to be to inject you know, what that anti-federalist view would be, and particularly in a case where if the federalists and anti-federalists are really driving towards the same, um, you know, the view, I, I, again, I, you know, what you just mentioned about Franchise Tax Board, I think, is right. I think the more that the Federalists and Anti-Federalists either end up agreeing or the Federalists were just proven wrong and the Anti-Federalists were right, I think those are going to be the core areas that I think you're going to see the most use come from the Anti-Federalists. Aaron? Yeah, no, I, you know, I think it, it kind of gets to the, it's hard to answer the question without knowing the 
complete context and history of the thought, because to me, whether and, and you know, the right circumstances to deploy the anti-federalists are not kind of, you should interpret the Constitution this way because that's what they thought. Um, it's, it's circumstances where you can deploy them to say, in the context of this debate, you can take away from it an understanding of what everybody came to agreement on. Um, and so, you know, I think it really depends, in my mind, on whether you can kind of find the type of back and forth that helps animate the understanding of what the Constitution ultimately ended up saying, as opposed to kind of bringing them in in more of like in a, you know, a, a, a capacity as some sort of amicus to offer their thoughts on what they think the Constitution should have been saying. Right. Well, one of the uh, themes of Judge Oldham's article in the, um, the Law Review article that he wrote recently uh, was the principal concerns of the Anti-Federalists. The permanence, the presidency, but of course there was no 22nd Amendment, that didn't come until 1951. Uh, the second, the lack of responsiveness to the people. And the third one, which he then applies in the, in the concept, context of the administrative law, is executive officers wielding too much power. Is this, Aaron, where this was coming in, uh, possibly uh, for the litigation that you were doing? The third theme? A little bit, um, you know, but I, th I think, you know, it's, it's it, 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 this is exactly like kind of where it starts to me to be, where you have to be a little careful about where and how you use the views of the anti-federalists. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for the notion that they, you know, that, that today you can look at some things and say they were prescient um, about them, but to me that's not like a constitutional interpretation argument um, that starts to become, you know, that's, that's a, a great debate to have from a policy perspective. Um, on the flip side, I think that being able to make arguments like, uh, you know, like like Judge Oldham did when, when invoking them in one of his opinions of sort of, you know, like n even they and nobody would have thought that this is what the Constitution was supposed to mean. Uh, and, and this is exactly the executive power that they were promised wasn't granted, you know, is, is a great way to put it all together. Um, and I think that that's, you know, some of the ways, I mean, that, that's very much the way they got invoked in Hyatt. Scott, your thoughts on that? Well, so uh, kind of piggybacking off of the administrative law side of this all, I, I think a few, a couple academics have recently uh, put forward a view, uh, these are academics I believe are quite liberal, that uh, from an originalist perspective, delegation of power is actually fine. Um, I really doubt that they have looked at the anti-federalist side of this all. And that would just be another area where if you paired what the Federalists were saying against the critiques of the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists saying, no, 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 we are, this is not going to lead to these results of, you know, we're still going to have the separation of powers and all that. You know, I think combining it in that type of way, I think is a very powerful way uh, of making the argument. But to Aaron's point, you're never going to, at least as an advocate, I don't think you're ever going to say, you must interpret this text that way because that's exactly what the Anti-Federalists said. No, you, you're always going to pair it with one of those other mechanisms of, well, well the Federalists said it too, we all agreed on that. Um, and, and that this is just such a core value animating what was going on uh, at our founding that of course the Constitution should be interpreted that way. Julia? You know, when we've been saying that the anti-federalists are right about a lot of things, or at least when, I, when I've been saying that, I think it's really in terms of how things have turned out in practice, not necessarily they were right in their criticism of the Constitution as designed. Because as uh, to answer the question that uh, someone asked Judge Oldham after his presentation, you know, what uh, uh, constitutional amendment would they like? I think it's probably the same one that the Federalists would like, which is at the end of every clause, add, and we mean it. <laughs> because that would limit a lot of these problems that they, that they warned uh, against. And so, you know, in this administrative law realm, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll have to wait for the, uh, the sequel to Judge Oldham's article, you know, what Cincinnatus and Federal Farmer thought about the uh, Chevron deference. <laughs> Before we start uh, po uh, answering questions from the audience, are there any commentary that any of the uh, panelists have on any other um, arguments or uh, offerings of the other panelists? Happy to hear from the audience. All right. All right, well, we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, Roger. This is where you really earn your CLE. 
Ilya, not that the um, director emeritus would want to try to influence the director of the Cato Institute <laughs> Center for Constitutional Studies, but it turns out that Cato may have an interest in the, um, the electoral college case because it raises squarely, in my judgment, the importance of the role of the court, of the states, as states in the outcome of elections. And this is something that seems to me the anti-federalists were a little um, perplexed about. They stood for, for the states for sure, and yet, uh, uh, and, and in fact, this goes back to the great compromise between the, the, uh, the uh, small states and the big states. And so maybe in preserving that set of checks on um, runaway democracy, there may be some reason for uh, taking a look at the um, electoral college issue from the consideration of preserving the role of states as states. Well, the uh, current director will take the suggestion of the uh, director <laughs> under <emeritus>. advisement. <laughs> under advisement. <laughs> This sounds like the Soviet Union. I, I <laughs> yes, Professor. So I was just thinking about um, Judge Keller's suggestion that one place where we might look to the anti-federalists is where it turns out that as a matter of interpretation, um, <laughs> the anti-federalists were right. Um, and that made me think about something we haven't really mentioned today, which is maybe why they don't get cited so much, in part maybe because during the debate, the rhetoric was the federalists arguing for the limitation of the power of the federal government, and the anti-federalists saying, no, this thing is gonna be really expansive. And so if you look at who's prone to citing something written in the 1780s today, um, those who are usually arguing for the limitation of national power um, want to go to the Federalists because they were arguing, no, that Commerce Clause is going to be narrow, <laughs> and not go to the Anti-Federalists who are saying it's going to eat everything. Um, and those who tend not to cite the 1780s um, have other arguments for arguing that the Commerce Clause eats everything. And I'm wondering if maybe it's that kind of um, tendency to even go originalist in the first place, the people who would want to use the Anti-Federalists to support their argument don't look at these kinds of arguments. But, so I actually think it's a mistake to, you know, add that from, from just like an advocacy perspective to, to, I think you could be right, but to ignore the other side of it because I think saying that the Federalists were saying there's a limitation is even more powerful when you put it in the context of saying, and they were explaining that in response to people who said, this is gonna be understood this way. And they said, no, 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 it's, it's meant to be understood this way. And you know, that, that seems to me to be a critical part of the whole debate to see why they're saying that and what's leading them to say that. And you know, if you look at it in some of those contexts, like if you look at it back, I mean, in, in Hyatt, I think is a good example of that debate going on where they were saying, we're afraid it'll be understood this way. And you know, that's, as to the 11th Amendment, like they kind of proved right, but I think everybody thinks that the court messed that up, not the Constitution. Um, and you know, if you put it in, into understanding the back and forth, it seems to me that it, it doesn't hurt to understand that the other side had the concern if the response was, no, you're misunderstanding what the Constitution is, and if that was the response that was given to you know, everybody very publicly. The, the only thing I'd add, I agree with all that, is just, you know, in the same way that, you know, we're all textualists now, I mean, I think you look at Heller and you say we're all originalists now, that even if, even if someone doesn't believe that originalism is the proper method of interpreting the Constitution, they are still having to make originalist arguments because there are so many now opinions and precedents and jurists that are using originalism. And so to your point, maybe historically that's been the case, but I think going forward, uh, you know, whatever founding uh, sources are gonna be, I think advocates and courts are gonna be marshalling those arguments. And I'm just gonna add one quick thought that was spurred, prompted by what you said, but I also think it's an important project on you know, the part of those who are interested in, in all of this to, Make sure people understand, you know, who was who was whom in this debate, because I I do think in this vein of everybody does originalism nowadays, you get a lot of 
briefs that are thrown in there by folks who just think if they say something that was historical, it counts as originalist. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a little bit of the debate that was going on in Heller with you know, Justice Scalia yeah. saying, like, Justice Stevens, you can't say the Second Amendment means what you know the, the anti-federalists thought it meant. That that all doesn't really make sense. Um, so I think it's important. You know, it's it's helpful to the whole originalism project to make sure people understand what are these sources and who are we actually quoting and which side of the debate were they on when they were saying X, Y, or Z. Good point. Go, to Professor, first. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, this is Chris Green again. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, about the prospects for a certain kind of argument, sort of a, a silver blaze kind of argument uh, about non-barking dogs. Uh, so it seems to me extremely powerful. A silver uh, blades argument? So silver blaze. So Sherlock Holmes, you know, there's a dog that didn't bark. And he says, well, you know, the kid clue is he must have known the person. So didn't bark. <laughs> so, but you want to be able to say things like this. The anti-federalists never complained about X. Uh, and you can only say that if you really, really know the entire literature. And you know, if, if, if the only time we talk about these folks is sort of dipping in and kind of picking out a quote instead of you know, spending, you know, instead of integrating this into our education so that you have a, do, do have a sense that yeah, the anti-federalists uh, never really complain about the commerce power taking over everything. Um, I'm just wondering if we're just losing something, we're missing something really, really essential about the anti-federalists just because we're not learning them as comprehensively as, uh, as we need to. And it's really only people who have read all of them which just you know, say like, I haven't, you know, Rappaport and Oldham and like, is that it? I mean, surely. Uh, uh, we and and your, your consulting fee is? <laughs> I mean, I, for those in the other room. stuff. You know. no, I mean, I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, that's exactly, you know, the kind of thing in my mind that, you know, I mean, maybe some of these arguments pan out, maybe some of them don't, but there's just no good reason to not be looking at the source the same way we would look at the you know the other the, the full debate in any other context um, and so and and obviously different judges find dog that didn't bark arguments more or less persuasive but I mean they they get made all the time in plenty of other contexts so it's it seems like a context that ought to be ripe for that as to at least some of the debates. Yeah, again, not for the purpose of who was right, who was wrong, but for explaining the Constitution uh, and for doing original public meaning, uh, that, you know, any source that you can, contemporaneous source that you can dig out is going to be useful. Yeah. Stage right. Yeah, I, um, one of the things I like about the argument is um, Federalists versus Anti-Federalists is the nice thing is you're both talking about people who actually wrote it. I mean, these are people who actually wrote it. And I think it's an interesting contrast, if you will, with legislative history. And um, I worked in the United States Senate, and I wrote legislative history, and I fought over legislative history. And I can tell you that the people who pass the legislation and who vote on the legislative history have no idea whatsoever <laughs> what is in the legislative history let alone what it means. And I find the interesting thing about a lot of these discussions is we have people from the Federalist Society who are in academia, and they're in the judicial, and they're in the executive, but very, very few come from the legislative side who understand how the thing actually works. I mean, these people are totally divorced from the process, and I give you as evidence Obamacare. They not only didn't read the legislative history, they didn't even read the legislation. <laughs> I mean, how do you justify using legislative history? Well, when you have the Chief in, Justice there to rewrite the statute for you, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but, but I mean, but I mean, it, it, I mean, it gets involved in a serious argument about using legislative history. And, and my question is really reality versus theory. I mean, how can you even make the argument when the reality has not only been there for generations, but particularly in the modern context, but you have something like Obamacare, which is living, breathing proof of the point. 
Sounds like a question on the role of legislative history in these con this context. Yeah, so I also worked in the U.S. Senate, and I can also tell you, and I can think of a couple examples where you inserted stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, you you have to. <laughs> Wouldn't you? you, if you, you Again, you're not, you're not doing your, your job. <laughs> but but that's the point. You'd also point out, you know, if you were the dissenting view in the legislative history, someone needs to point these things out. But look, I can echo your concern that you know there is not some phantom internal process by which every senator on the particular committee passing a bill out of committee has thoroughly looked through the committee report. I mean, look, if the chief counsel had been the one who actually worked on the committee report, that's something. I mean, usually legislative history was delegated down to a deputy uh, counsel on, on the committee. And, and then, of course, maybe the chief counsel would then kind of tinker around with it. But, but yes, to your point, I think a very underappreciated facet uh, of how poor legislative history and statutory interpretation can be is this unexamined phenomenon of how exactly is a committee report created? What does it even look like? I mean, even anecdotal experience, like your experience, my experience, I, I think people would be uh, maybe not shocked, but I think you'd think even less of legislative history from at least in the modern perspective when you do understand that. And, and to your point, though, that's, I think, in very stark contrast with what you see with the Federalist Papers and the, anti and the anti federalists who are deeply involved in debating these provisions and, and the, the public meaning of the words that were being used at the time. Well, and I... I agree with you about the use of the word of the I say that because I once had in mind the United States Senate the person on the other side who agreed to the changes falsified the document, and if I hadn't driven in the snow to the hill to read it myself, it would have been the legislative history. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, though, I do think you, you touched upon what to me is, is an important distinction to not lose sight of. I mean, you know, I, I think part of what legitimizes relying on the Federalist Papers that should every bit as much legitimize looking at the Anti-Federalist Papers is I mean, these were widely circulated documents to the people who were deciding what they thought about the Constitution. I mean, most of us have read a, a tiny fraction of the U.S. Code and read essentially never any legislative history about something that our legislators were voting on. You know, so it, it, I think that it's it, it, it's an easy thing for everyone to kind of, for a lot of the, the, the critics out there to say, oh, well, you criticize this, but you're fine with relying on this. And I, I do think they have, you know, very important distinctions that impact their relevancy and legitimacy as interpretive tools. Yes. Yes, my name is Daniel Lowenstein. I'm an emeritus professor of law at UCLA and currently the director at UCLA of the Center for the Liberal Arts and Free Institutions. Uh, yesterday at a completely different meeting, I had the pleasure of uh, seeing Roger Pallone for the first time uh, in 25 years. And on that occasion- He hasn't changed, right? <laughs> uh, well, no, in a way that I'll get to because uh, uh, on that occasion 25 years ago, we were disagreeing over the question of the uh, uh, constitutionality of uh, congressional term limits. And I'm sorry to say that on this occasion, I think we're going to disagree on the question of uh, the faithless elector. Uh, and I, I'm, this doesn't have to do with the Anti-Federalists, but I, I think this might be the only audience of this size you could compile in America in which a good majority of the people probably favor the Electoral College, so you might be a little interested in this. Uh, I think that um, the, uh, the, the framers of the original Constitution, I think, I think probably everybody agrees, contemplated that the uh, Electoral College would be a uh, deliberative institution. By the way, the, the name Electoral College is really not a good name because a college suggests that they all meet together and in the Constitution specifically they have to meet in their separate, separate states. But I think there clearly is an idea that the people who would be chosen as electors would exercise their judgment to uh, pick uh, a good person for president. Uh, now, that system didn't work the way they intended and the 12th Amendment, I believe, endorsed the changed system that we are used to. But there can be situations in which the deliberative uh, or judgmental function of the electors uh, could be very important. And what I'm thinking of is a situation in which after the presidential election, but before the electors vote, um, something might happen to 
create really serious questions about the person who was elected. You might have a stroke or, or something like that. There might be some really serious scandal that emerges. I'm not thinking about a phone call, but you know something that's really serious in which it might be uh, much less cumbersome than the 25th Amendment, which takes hold after the new president is inaugurated, uh, to resolve that question uh, politically, uh, because the electors have been chosen uh, to support this candidate. They're not people who are trying to undercut him. Uh, and uh, uh, under this situation, which you know, it's not that unlikely that it will ever arise. Uh, uh, the Electoral College could, could perform a, uh, a very valuable function. I, I wrote a piece uh, a long time ago uh, in a debate on the Electoral College for the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania Law Review, and I had five reasons why I thought the Electoral College really serves us well, and I think, if anything, uh, this contingency I thought was the most important. Uh, I agree, obviously, with Roger that, uh, as a general principle, I'm, I'm, I'm a real states person. I had experience in state government. I have all the stereotypes about the imperious federal government and the bureaucrats and so on. But I don't think that the state power is as, you know, as, as clear or as important or, or, or even valid when it is a question of controlling what people with federal functions are going to do. So I think that that interest, although it's not completely absent, is not that strong. And I think there are really strong reasons uh, not to, uh, uh, it, it really not to permit uh, these faithless elector regulations. Thanks. Can you come, Elio? Uh, I'm not an expert on the Electoral College, but it, it, it seems to me that it doesn't, I mean, the, what you wrote about or w what you're getting at doesn't necessarily answer the question in this particular case because issues could arise not just with faithless electors, but with the National Popular Vote Compact or a state regulation saying, uh, our electors are not uh, are not bound. I mean, you're voting for them, and the candidates get them, but they are. You know, we will not punish. And in fact, if an elector has a good faith reason to vote otherwise, you know, they can do that, or or what have you. Kind of the opposite regulation that's at issue in uh, in, in in these states, uh, and somebody could sue over that. Uh, so. Uh, I don't know. Um, is uh, you know, it's not a, a very good uh, uh, response to your to your question, but I think it's uh, uh, the issues you raise don't necessarily um, uh, answer the, the 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 question presented in this particular case. Roger, do you want equal time? <laughs> 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 All, right. All right. Other questions we may have, sir. Yeah, I'm curious whether there would be any philosophical or, or sort of theoretical constitutional ground for differentiating between situations uh, like debates over Article 1, 2, and 3 and debates over the meaning of the Bill of Rights, where the Bill of Rights is actually largely uh, instigated at the behest of the anti-federalist arguments. Um, and uh, would that be a, a sort of basis on which you might want to actually rely more in an affirmative way on anti-federalist uh, positions? <laughs> Well, yes, in, in the sense that, you know, I think then we're shifting away from, instead of viewing the Anti-Federalists as the opposition, that they were the proponents. Uh, and I think the closer you get to that, the more you can then directly rely on the Anti-Federalists to say something along the lines of, well, no, this, they were actually participating in the affirmative creation of that and not just trying to oppose it. Uh, but of course, that's going to get into the history of the particular provision. Um, but, but yes, I, I think you can definitely you know, make the historical argument depending on the uh, provision and the, and the content of the provision you're talking about. It is something that, that I found notable just in the handful of cases and contexts where the court has thought about the anti federalists they, they tend to be more structural powers type questions um, and not, you know, uh, they, I mean, with the exception of Heller where I think it was kind of largely invoked in a less than legitimate way uh, by, by the dissent there in part. Um, the, it seems to come up more, and I think that's partly just a nature of where the, where the bigger debates were being had. But it is kind of it, something that I found curious that as to the part of the Constitution where they had the most important role in it existing, they seems to be the least uh, use of them in terms of any decisions the courts are using to interpret those provisions, which is just 
been anomalous. Any other questions? Join me in thanking this great panel.